he was buried, he rose again, and he lives, and he's coming back. As you can tell, the children are being dismissed back to Children's Church, and today's Children's Church involves peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And so I'm going to step aside for a few minutes and go snack. No, I'm just kidding. But it's, it's a great little object lesson planned for them today, and I appreciate our children and what they're learning uh, through the Sunday school ministries and the different ministries, children's church and so forth. And, and while they're eating peanut butter and jelly, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. And we're going to eat pulse and drink water today. Okay, you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Daniel chapter number one. Daniel chapter one. <clears throat> today we continue uh, the thoughts we began last Sunday. As I mentioned last Sunday, as I've watched our culture and the changes in the last several years, but really in the last just recent time, and different things that have come out, different things that have been said, uh, different way things are being presented. And as I mentioned last Sunday, I don't want to give uh, even give them the time to mention those things today, but it's quite disturbing. And I look at our families, and I look at our children and our grandchildren, and I, I think we need to be prepared on what it means to be faithful and stay faithful while living in a foreign land. And we see a wonderful example of that in Daniel, with Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and, Zach and, and uh, Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that, those are their, the others are their Hebrew names. And how they continue to be faithful strongly uh, and, and in, in a firm way, faithful to the Lord, although they were living in a foreign land. And we began last Sunday talking in the first half of chapter 1, and we saw the topic a long way from home. Uh, they were about a thousand miles from home in a strange land and a strange culture, and uh, this new culture, this Babylonian culture, was seeking to indoctrinate and absorb these young men into their culture, which is what is happening today. Uh, the culture in our nation many times that stands against the word of God is trying to get all of us, and they do target our children. They're targeting young people to absorb them into that mindset and absorb them into that way of thinking. And we have to all realize if we know Christ as personal Savior, we too are a long way from home. Heaven is our home. That is where our citizenship is. Yes, we need to be uh, good citizens of our nation, of our state, of our community. We need to be involved citizens. We need to vote. We need to be involved in contacting elected officials. But at the end of the day, there's one king we must please, and that is our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we studied that and talked about that last Sunday. But now as we continue through chapter 1, there's another part of what it means and what it takes to be able to remain faithful and live faithfully in a foreign land. And that is what we see in verse 5 and verse 8. So we'll just read verse 5 and verse 8 to get started in Daniel chapter 1, then go through the rest of the chapter throughout the message this morning. Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah were taken captive among, they were many, just a few among many of these, these Hebrew young men. And the Bible says in Daniel 1, 5, The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now skip down to verse number 8. We covered 6 and 7 uh, last week. But look at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank, Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. That phrase, Daniel purposed in his heart. So let's think about this. To, to live faithfully in a foreign land, it requires this. To say, be able to say with all of our hearts, I have decided. I have decided. Let's bow our heads and hearts in a word of prayer. Right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, would you ask the Lord to speak to you and, and give you what we all need from his word today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for the authority that the scriptures gives us and the rule of faith and practice. Well, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our true teacher and guide uh, through the scriptures this morning, that you would open our hearts 
and open our eyes to these truths. Lord, help us, as Daniel and his friends did, to live faithfully, even though we live a long way from home. We're in a foreign land, Father, but help us to be faithful to you and your word and your will for us. Take this time and use it for your glory. If there's someone here that doesn't know Christ as personal Savior, someone who perhaps is struggling with the assurance of salvation, speak to that heart through the power of the gospel today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have decided. It's a popular song. We sing it quite a bit. And we talk about I have decided to follow Jesus. And there's what? No turning back. And essentially, that's what Daniel did here. So here's another important key, an importance of being decided, an importance, the importance of being resolute. And so three or four things I want us to see in this passage from verse 8 down through the end of the chapter, verse 21 this morning. And first of all, let's talk about the resolution that was made, the resolution that was made. It says, Daniel purposed in his heart. The word purpose there literally means to make a decided resolution. He decided, this is where I'm going to stand. This is where I'm going to come down on this. And he did so in order not to defile himself. He says, I will not defile myself. As we read, the Babylonians were instructed to give to uh, Daniel and his friends and all these young people uh, the king's meat, the best meat, the finest meat, and the king's wine, the best wine, the finest wine, and it seems like they all partook of that except these four young men. But Daniel purposed not to defile himself because this was meat more than likely that was not killed in accordance to the law of Moses. We're not going to take the time today to go back through the law of Moses about how to prepare, how to kill and prepare and eat the meat uh, that the way the Jews were instructed through the law of Moses. But this meat was probably not killed in accordance to the law of Moses. More than likely at times it was going to be meat that was prohibited by the law of Moses. And it was meat and drink more than likely that had been involved in idol worship. And Exodus 34, 15 talks about being careful uh, of giving, having a part in idol worship by consuming meats and drinks under the law of Moses. It was given to them this command that were offered to idols. And we've talked about that in the New Testament times. We've covered all that. We'll do it again sometime. But according to the way that Daniel had been reared, according to the law of Moses that he had been taught, and the scriptures he had learned as a child, probably through his parents, perhaps through his grandparents, he, he realized that what he would be doing would be in violation of the law of God. And it would be, a time, it would be something that would defile him and defile his friends. So he made a resolution. He said, I will not be defiled. I will not partake. I will not, I don't want to defile myself. And he purposed, and that's a strong word. As I said, it means he was very resolute. But look at how he made this resolution. He purposed, which is a very strong term, he was very resolute and decided in this, that he would not defile himself. And it says in the latter part of verse 8, therefore, what did he do? He demanded. He went into the chief, the prince of the eunuch's office and pounded on his desk and said, Bless God, I am not eating that meat. Is that how he handled that? No, look at what the Bible says. Therefore he requested. He did so with respect. He was going to stand. He wasn't going to change. He was going to be very purposeful, decided, and resolute but yet, yet he still approached the manner in which he conducted himself and spoke to the prince of the eunuchs in a respectful manner. And, and, I, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But as I've gone through the book of Daniel, these first few chapters that we're going to be studying, that is something that's been there all along since the book was written. So the scripture hasn't changed. But this is something that has jumped out at me. And we'll see this on several occasions throughout the book. Those young men, these young men who stood and were very resolute in their decisions and their stand and not to defile themselves, to not worship the false idols, to pray to the true God, they always conducted themselves with respect. 
They always did so in such a way. Yes, sometimes people got mad at them. Yes, they ended up being thrown into the lion's den or the fiery furnace. Yes, there were people who did not like them and sought to undermine them. But in all that they did, they did this treating others with respect. And again, I, you'll hear that throughout this study. I can already see that coming in the book of Daniel. And so this resolution he made was with respect. Remember what Paul said in Romans 14, 16. In Romans 14, he's talking about different convictions and standards. Uh, and and there, we've talked about the universal convictions, personal, conditional convictions. We've studied that. But he says this, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Listen, the, the culture that does not care for Christ is going to speak ill of our faith and speak ill of the scriptures and speak ill of our God and the standards that the Bible holds us to. But it, it should not be because of our attitude and our conduct, and our demeanor. And, and I thought this was so interesting. He requested of the prince of the eunuch. So we see the resolution. He was very decided. He was very much on purpose. He, he knew in his heart, I will not defile myself. And if you finish, as you read through the passage, you see that Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah felt the same way. They said, we will not be moved. But when he went to request and make his request, he did so with respect. So that's the resolution that was made. The second thing I see from verse 9 down through verse 14 is the response. What was the response? What happened in response to this resolution? And the first thing that I see, and you see it through the book of Daniel, and again, we'll note this as we go through the book. First, there is a divine intervention. There is a divine intervention. Look at what it says in verse 9. Now God, God was involved. God honored this decision. God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. There was divine intervention. Now, let me hasten to add, uh, and we'll show this as we go through the book. Sometimes things turn out well when these men took a stand. Sometimes it didn't. And throughout the scriptures, you see people that stood for the Lord and it turned out well. You see people who stood for the Lord and it did not turn out so well, humanly speaking, for them. You go through human history and there are those who have stood for the faith throughout the centuries uh, of, of Christian history, rather. And sometimes they were honored and rewarded and sometimes they were martyred. They were slain. And that's up to God. But here's the fact. God was pleased and God intervened. There is a divine intervention. And in this case, he brought favor. The word favor is the idea of mercy. And it says he brought tender love. And that's the idea of compassion, even pity. In other words, God instilled into the heart of Melzar, the prince of the eunuchs. He wanted to have mercy on these young men. And Daniel, the Bible says in Daniel 6, he had an excellent spirit. He had a respectful spirit. And this man, because of the divine intervention, had mercy, compassion, literally pity on these men. But yet also in this response, not just the idea of mercy, but there is the response from Melzar, there is hesitancy. You have to remember whom he served. He served Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a bad guy. Nebuchadnezzar was, was one just with a look or just with the motion of his hand. People would die. We've been reading through the, uh, the biography of Adoniram Judson for our Men of the Word Bible study. And they were talking about the emperor, the new emperor that came into power uh, in the early 1800s while Adoniram Judson was serving there. Uh, and I can't remember the guy's name, probably couldn't pronounce it if I did remember his name. And uh, when he, he took power, he decided he wanted to get rid of all, all opposition, potential opposition. So he sewed members of his family, his own brother if I'm not mistaken, and members of his family, he sewed them up into red bags, red cloth bags, because they were royalty and he wanted to treat them with respect as royalty, then he threw them all in the river. These are the types of kings that were in existence, and they were cruel. Nebuchadnezzar was the same way. And look at verse 10. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and drink. 
that, listen, the king said this. This isn't up to me, Daniel. This is the king's order. For why should he see your faces worse liking? That simply means worse looking. He's going to look at you and say, you have not been eating. And he's going to call me on the carpet. He says, see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort. In other words, all your companions that eat and drink this are going to be in great shape and you're not. Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. So, of course, there was hesitancy on the part of Melzar. He said, Daniel, that's fine. You've got your religion. That's good. I get it. But what about me? This could cost me my head. There was a hesitancy there. But look at Daniel's response. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs uh, had set over Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink, and then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. So in this response, there was divine intervention. God was there. And you see it throughout the book of Daniel. But there was hesitancy on the part of, of Melzar, who was their handler, I guess you could say, to give them the food. He says, my head's on the chopping block, literally, if this doesn't turn out well. And so there was, once again, respect. He says, prove that. He said, okay, Daniel said, give it a shot. Just test us. We're not going to appear before the king for three years. We saw that back up in... Verse 5, it's going to be three years before we go before the king. This is a three-year thing. So give us ten days. Just ten days, you test us, and then we'll see. And, and, and so there is a respectful request because Daniel had purposed. He, was, he wanted to be able to stay true to who he was as a citizen of a foreign country that had been brought, and he had been brought up in the Scriptures. He says, so just give us pulse to eat. Now, pulse is a word that means something grown from a seed. Something grown from a seed. <clears throat> In other words, he said, just give us vegetables and water. There was nothing wrong with eating meat as long as it conformed for them as Jewish young men to the law of Moses. But, but just to avoid that, they say, you know what? We're just going to avoid meat altogether. So just give us something grown from seeds. Give us some some butter beans, give us some squash, give us some tomatoes, give us some turnip, no, probably not turnip greens, that's, un, that's unscriptural, turnip greens, for me anyway. Um, no, give us something grown from seeds. Let us eat vegetables and drink water. And just test it, males are, for 10 days. And in 10 days, see how we're doing. Boy, and I, I don't want to keep jumping ahead, but what a step of faith. What a step of faith. Daniel was determined. He would not be deterred from not defiling himself. Now, what his plan B would have been if Melzar just turned him down flat, we don't know. But I have an idea because we see that throughout the book of how they stood. And when their request was denied, they still stood. But here's the key in this response. We've seen the resolution, but one thing I see in this response, Daniel recognized the effect of his stand on those around him. Daniel recognized the effect of his stand on those around him. He wasn't going to compromise. That's very clear as you read through the book. Uh, he wasn't going to back down on who he was and what he believed. But he did acknowledge that though there were those around him that did not see it that way, didn't feel that way, and he wanted to be firm. He wanted to show who he was, and he wanted to manifest, hey, just give it a shot, listen to us. Give it ten days and then see. But he did so with respect, understanding how it would affect those around him. You see, if we go out like a bull in a china shop trying to force others to see it our way, we could hurt the cause of Christ. I, I've, I've, when I was in college, we preached on the streets downtown Atlanta. 
And nothing wrong with that if it's done the right way. But I can remember street preachers, and I've been around those before. Uh, they do more damage. And maybe if you were a street preacher, I don't want to. But sometimes just the way they talk. One time we were going to the Braves game years ago and uh, at Turner Field, and there were guys out there street preaching telling the crowd they were going to die and go to hell because they were going to the pagan ball game. Now, the way the Braves play sometimes, I get it. Okay, I understand. Just kidding. But, uh, but I'm thinking, okay, because they believe the same gospel I believe. And they believe Jesus just like I believe Jesus in the gospel and, and all that. But wow, people were laughing and mocking. There's nothing wrong with being somewhat lovingly confrontational about our faith and giving the gospel and talking to people about Christ. We need to engage. We need to be salt and light. But Daniel did so with respect. And he did so understanding, yeah, Melzar's head's on the chopping block. He doesn't know my God like I know my God. So let's see how we can work with this to do what we need to do, but yet show him God's glory at the same time. And that's, that's where we need the Holy Spirit. That's where we need to do, as we'll see later on today as we go through this book, we need God's wisdom on how to be decided, how to be purpose, purposeful, how to be resolute, but yet understand those who don't know Christ are blind spiritually. The God of this world has blinded their minds. And no, they're not going to understand. They're not going to see. Uh, in other words, why do we yell at the TV? Anybody yell at the TV sometimes when you watch the news? Like, what is wrong with these people? They don't know Christ. They don't have Christ in their hearts. They need the gospel. And if they hit, had the gospel, see, that's the solution, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there's the resolution. He was quite purpose. He was quite resolute. He was very decided. But then the response was, I don't know, Daniel. This, this could get me in trouble. Daniel said, just try it. He was purposeful but with respect. So what was the result? Verse 15 down through verse 21 shows us the result of Daniel being decided. He and his, four, he and his three friends. Look at verse 15. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. They tried it for ten days and the Lord blessed and they were healthy and they were strong and they were sharp mentally and they were on top of things physically. Look at verse 17. As for these four children, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So what was the result? Daniel way back said, I will not defile myself. Everybody else is doing it, but we four will not. But yet he moved forward with respect. He moved forward speaking the truth in love, as we talk about often, and we see the result was the Lord's blessing to all four. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning. Now, they were bright. I don't know if they had to take a test before they left Israel, Judah, to go to Babylon because they were supposed to take, uh, Babylonians were instructed to take those who were skillful in wisdom. I don't know if they checked their SAT scores or what, but God gave them knowledge. And they became head and shoulders above the rest because God blessed their stand. So the Lord blessed, but he gave Daniel a specific blessing, which will come out next week, Lord willing. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Daniel could interpret dreams. Think Joseph and Pharaoh back in the book of Genesis. Daniel could interpret dreams and visions, which he does in the next chapter. So the Lord blessed all four. He gave that specific terms, uh, that specific blessing to Daniel. But then look at what it says. There is a long-term blessing, not just the immediate of being skillful in the wisdom and, and what they were learning. Look at verse 18. Now, at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and notice this, among them all was found none like 
the vegetable group, the beans and water group, the decided, resolute group. Among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Now let's kind of think about this for a minute. Think about this for a minute. So you, this went on for three years. Now, I, Melzar was really, he was pumped. He was so glad. He was happy. But they went before the king. And just three years later, they were ten times better than the rest. Not just ten times better than the rest of the young men that had come with them that had bowed to the ways of the Babylonians. He was ten times better than all the ones that had been there and grew up in Babylon and knew the language and knew the culture and knew the sciences and knew all their learning. learning. They were better than what he already had. God blessed the stand. But not just three years later did they find themselves ten times better. But look at verse 21. Here the, the, the writer, the scriptures... Or is doing what I've been doing throughout this, kind of jumping ahead. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus was the king of the Medes and Persians. Back 70 years later, practically, Daniel continued. Daniel stayed faithful. Daniel carried through all the way to the time of Cyrus, jumping ahead those 70 years. Now, at some point, the Bible stops mentioning uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We don't know when they passed away, but we see Daniel, an old man, there in chapter 6, still faithful. How did that happen? Because it's a young man. And that word children, we mentioned it last week in verse 4 of chapter 1. A lot of Bible scholars say those young men were probably 12, 14, 15 years old. Because a young man and his friend says we will not be defiled. They were purposed. They were decided. They were resolute. So the Lord blessed and gave them the skill, gave them the knowledge, and he kept them faithful all those years. So today we've seen the resolution. Daniel said, I will not, I've purposed in my heart, I, we will not defile ourselves with this. There is some hesitancy. They were respectful. They were firm, resolute, yet respectful, and, and God blessed, and they were able to maintain that, that position, and God, in the result, blessed all four. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? Isn't it great to see what God does, but what does that mean if there's not an application for you and for me? So let's see, last of all this morning, our responsibility. What do we do with Daniel's story? What do we do with this? We are living in a foreign land. Uh, this is not our home, as we talked about last week. This world is not our home. We're just, as the song says, passing through. We're citizens of heaven. We're to conduct ourselves as citizens of heaven. And we too have a responsibility. Our faithfulness in this day and age in which we live also depends on living on purpose for purity. We must live on purpose for purity. In what we believe. Listen, folks, no matter what people say or what culture says, this book has not changed. It's forever inspired, forever settled in heaven, forever the Word of God. And the morality taught in this book is still true today. The doctrine and theology taught in this book is still true today. The way we're to live, what we're to do and not to do, is still true today. We must live on purpose for purity in what we believe. We must live on purpose for purity in what we do. We must live on purpose for purity in our relationships. We must be decidedly resolute in all matters, no matter who is around us or what happens around us. We must be decidedly resolute. Listen, when I was growing up, it, and I won't say it was easier. I think every generation thinks 
that that we, you know it's harder and you got to look at the Daniel what he faced and what Paul faced in the New Testament that early church did but I tell you it has changed it has changed since I was growing up whereas we, we used to lose our youth when they were in a, in a secular college hearing all that now then it kind of trickled down now it was high school now from what they say we're losing kids in middle school and and, and children that are faithful in middle school to church, 66% of them by the time they're in their 20s not in church can't find them. Something's happening. And the age is getting younger and younger and younger. Tina and I were talking. We went out to lunch with some friends yesterday. We were talking about the devil's real patient. He's real patient. He'll just keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And if he can just take one generation a little bit back and the next generation a little bit back, and the next generation a little bit back, pretty soon this generation will say, what happened? But if you study the last 30, 40, 50 years, you can see the progression. So we must be, no matter what, decidedly resolute, no matter who is around us, all the other young men from from Judah ate the meat, drank the wine. But Daniel says, we're not. Or what happens around us? Now, God intervened and their request was granted. But knowing what I know about Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael that I see in the rest of the book, if they'd have said, no, you eat or you die, they'd have said, we're not eating. They would have stood firm. Because you see that throughout the book. We too must be resolute. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. So what is our responsibility? Well, the New Testament tells us very clearly there's so much we could see. Let's just look at a couple of things in Ephesians chapter number 4. In Ephesians 4, to live on purpose for purity, to be decided, to be resolute. Ephesians 4, 27, and, and a, a kind, of, kind of like a machine gun presentation of truth in the latter part of Ephesians 4, Paul writes this one thing, neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. And that idea of giving place is a foothold. Remember when, when General Douglas MacArthur was retaking the islands in the South Pacific in World War II? He did the island hopping campaign, and, and the, the forces would go ashore just to establish a what? You know, a beachhead. And they, would, they would gain the beaches. And once they gained the beaches and secured the beaches, they could begin to move inland. And Paul warns us, the scriptures warn us as believers, don't give the devil a beachhead. Don't give him a foot in the door. He will not be satisfied. I can remember not so long ago, in the last couple of decades, there were those who said, hey, just leave us alone. Let us love each other how we want to love each other. That's all we're interested in. But now that same group of people are saying, hey, we're, we're going to make sure your children accept us. We will convert your children. So what happened? That is the goal. That is the goal of the culture that fights against the word of God and the faith we hold dear. They are out to defeat God. Satan's goal is to defeat God. Whether or not he thinks it can be done, I don't know the mind of Satan. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? You don't know the mind of Satan. I don't know if he really believes it. He's such a liar and deceiver. Many times liars begin to believe their own lies. But Satan is after the next generation. He may not get all he wants this generation, but he's going to try to make progress. So give no foothold to the devil. Don't give him a beachhead. Look at chapter 5, verse 8. Chapter 5, verse 8. Again, a good principle, thinking of this, I have decided. Daniel says, we've decided. Now, Melzar, we're asking you this. We're going to be respectful, but this is, we've decided this. Ephesians 5, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Act differently. Now you're in light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Test it. Growing up, I did this, right? You did it. 
your children did it, my children did it, when you said, no, you can't do this, they'll say, well, Dad, what's what? What's wrong with that? Anybody ever heard that? How many of you use that? I'll put both my hands up. Well, what's wrong with that? The Bible says, let's ask what's right with that. Prove what is acceptable to the Lord. If this is, is coming into my life and coming into my home and coming into my mindset, does it please God? And, verse 11, have no fellowship, because these two things, verse 10 and 11, go hand in hand, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Reprove them. Stand against them. And granted, we've seen in Ephesians back in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 15, we speak that truth in love, and that's our church theme. We, we have, uh, we just, what is our foundation? Truth, right? Our, our obligation is to speak, but our motivation must be love. But as we do that, we stand against the unfruitful, the un, that in which is not beneficial works of darkness. And have no fellowship means don't be companions. Don't look to partner with them. So we must not allow defilement, not personally. We must not allow defilement, not in our home, not in our ministry, not in our work ethic when we're on the job. We must not give the devil a foothold. I'm afraid that's sometimes where we falter. And sometimes when things happen, we'll say, well, what's wrong with that? Instead of asking what's right with that. Is it pleasing to the Lord? Does this help me? in my Christian testimony, my Christian walk. Is it helping me please the Lord? And one thing that jumped out at me and our responsibility, these four faithful young men, for them, it required a change in diet. Back in Judah, where they came from, they, they ate meat. They probably had good desserts. They had whatever they wanted according to the law of Moses. When it came time to live faithful in the foreign land, they had to change their diet. They had to be willing to stick to a quite austere diet. Now, some of you may, all you may eat is vegetables and drink water. Praise the Lord. Dare to be a Daniel, okay? Me, I like my hamburger every once in a while, okay? That outlaw ribeye at Longhorns, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, okay? But they were willing to say, you know what? We'd rather do without to make sure we please our Father. It was a, quite an austere diet compared to what their companions had. I wonder what those other guys thought. I wonder if it even crossed the other young men's mind. Maybe we should do this. Or were they just joking and laughing, making fun? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. So what is our responsibility? Don't give a foothold to the devil. Don't give him that beachhead. Prove, test, put to the test to see what is acceptable and pleasing to God. And in doing so, back off from that partnership with the unbeneficial, the unfruitful works of darkness and stand against them, reprove them, speaking truth in love. And understand that it may require a change. It may require getting rid of some things, changing some things that we might enjoy and just go to that bland vegetable and water diet but Daniel was willing to do that so what should we do if we're going to live faithful in a foreign land we have to decide we need to look for sources of defilement in our lives we need to look for and identify these sources of defilement and then we must decide, we must purpose, we must resolutely decide to abstain. So you know what? With all respect, no. That may be hard. It may be unpopular with those around you. It may be unpopular with co-workers, with sometimes even with family. It may be criticized. It may create some backlash. But we have to please God. Now we don't do so, as I said, we do so with respect. We don't do so just thinking we're better because we're not. We don't do so saying, hey, y'all just, just, just a bunch of pagans, heathens. We don't need to go there. 
But we are resolute, we are firm, and we live and speak the truth in love no matter what happens, no matter who's around. So to put where the rubber meets the road, I need to look at my media and make sure it's not a source of defilement. Because now, used to you say, just talk about TV, right? Now it could be a million things. I need to look at my media. I need to look at my relationships, my time consumers, my habits, my hobbies. Is it a source of defilement? Can I do these things? Does it enable, enable me to be salt and light? To live in a way that pleases and glorifies God and lifts up Christ in my life where others, though they do not agree, they see Christ in me and they see a Christ-like spirit in me. And if we do that, change may be necessary. There may be some things we have to change. Because I promise you this, if we go home today and say, God, if there's a source of defilement in in my life, show me. You know what the Holy Spirit is going to do? He is going to show us. But then what will we do? Will we be willing to make the change? We must remain kind, but remain resolute. And we must understand the importance of parental barriers. I think I wrote about this. Well, I don't think I know. I wrote about this Friday in, in the Friday email that I send out, the, the devotion, the pastor's heart, that, that parents, we have to learn to say no. Our young people may not quite understand. They may not quite get it. And they're young. They, may, they don't have the maturity, perhaps, that you and I have. And they need to be told no. And then shown why. You say, well, because I said so. That works, but it's, it's good to show them why. Show them, well, here's what the Bible says. Here's what God says. And I'm thankful. I had a mom and dad that when they put the clamps on, and I maybe didn't like it so much, they didn't say, well, because you're the preacher's kid. You've got, we, we're, the, we're the pastor's family. They never used that with me. My dad would say, well, because we're Christians. And this is what the Bible says. And you know, this Bible that he taught me is still true. And we need to show our children and grandchildren and draw the line. It may raise a ruckus in the house for a while. Will it not? We haven't had, May is not. It will raise a ruckus in the house, more than likely. But it's God. It's God's Word. And it's a good opportunity to teach the Word of God. We understand the importance of parental barriers. And that's why we go to God's Word and we find what the Bible teaches and we teach that. We don't teach preferences. We don't teach our ideas and our opinions. We teach the word of God. So we, we like the story of Daniel, don't we? We like his resolute nature. We like his Daniel purpose in his heart. So we sing that little chorus, dare to be a Daniel. A dare to stand alone. Dare to make a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. But what about us? Are we willing to be decided? Are we willing to to be resolute? Are we willing to live faithfully in a foreign land and do what it takes to live that way? You see, knowing we're a long way from home, that heaven is our place of citizenship, that Christ is our king, sure helps us be faithful. But also having an I have decided mentality and with respect for the glory of God, with a Christ-like spirit and attitude, we resolutely stand on the word of God. That's what it takes to faithfully live in a foreign land. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, look into your heart today. Has God spoken to you? What a great story, these young men. And for them, God blessed and they, they were promoted and God put them in a place where they could really make a difference. But as you go through the book, it wasn't always like that. They were criticized. They were persecuted. They were looked down upon another at other times. And I think if that had happened there, they would have still done the same thing. Daniel was resolute. He purposed. Would you ask God, would you dare to ask God today, God, in my life, in my home, in my attitude, in my work ethic, in my life, anywhere, if there's a source of defilement, 
that I need to be on guard against. Show me. That's what this world needs. This world needs us to be right with God. This world needs us to have the right heart and the right walk with Christ and then live that out every single day. However God spoke in your heart, would you talk to him about that today? Sir, ma'am, young person, quick question. If you died today, are you sure you'd go to heaven? We've talked to Christians today, but do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? If not, I've got great news. That's why Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. As Laura sang, our Redeemer lives. And he's lives, he lives to save you today. If you're not sure of your salvation, would you speak to me after the service? I'd love to take the word of God and show you what it means to know for sure you're going to heaven. Daniel said, I have decided. Would we be willing to say the same thing? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Use it now to speak to our hearts. Lord, use it to help us be resolutely decided for your glory. In Jesus' name. With your heads